Good morning, and welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I believe we've cracked 20 episodes now, so I'm very excited for that. Thank you for tuning in with me for that long, because we've been at this for a while now. I'm your host, Michael Smoke, if you've never listened before, or Higher Up Wellness on various social media outlets. And today, I'm going to be talking about something that I realized recently, which are the six ways that my life drastically improved as a result of getting physically fit that I did not necessarily expect. And I find this very interesting. It's it's an amazing value add when you realize you're chasing something altogether different in your goals. For me, it was chasing a look and being secure in myself. And all of these positive side effects started to happen as I pursued those, those other things out of a more, I guess, vain perspective. Nonetheless, I'm going to share these with you. And if you're struggling to get motivated to build the physique of your dreams or that you want because the vanity of it isn't enough or even the physical health isn't enough, maybe these unexpected side effects or at least unexpected for me will give you the drive and the reason to keep going on your journey and do this stuff for the rest of your life. The first one is somewhat health related, but more brain related specifically. And it is my executive function or simply defined my ability to complete a series of tasks, my productivity. Basically, I have severe ADHD and throughout school in my life, I struggled with it awfully. It was terrible. Bad, bad report cards, bad grades, too talkative, couldn't focus, never got my work done. You, you name it, anything under the sun, I struggled with when it came to focus. And looking back on it now, I believe it was a combination of a sedentary first half of the day and eating whatever the hell I wanted. I mean, I, I was in high school, I was playing sports, I could eat whatever I wanted and simply not struggle and not struggle with my weight. I was struggling everywhere else. And of course, there was a degree of, I don't give a shit about what the teacher's saying, but that's beside the point. I could focus on things I don't like now far better uh, than I could back then. So, excuse me. So I believe that there are a couple of things at play. One, first and foremost, I believe that I'm finally giving my brain the nutrients that it needs to thrive. I think For some reason, one of the things that people just overlook completely is micronutrients, or at least many people, they focus on the macros or not at all. They're not on the fitness journey, so they're not focused on any of it. But I I can't understate or overstate rather the importance of getting enough micronutrients in your diets at a cellular level. You need vitamins and minerals to function properly. So you need magnesium, sodium, potassium, zinc, boron, chloride, all of these things. And too many people even early in their fitness journey are focused on protein, carbs, and fats, but they're eating burgers and filling their carbs and fats with Oreos because they're doing, if it fits your macros and all that bullshit, I've been there, but I didn't feel good. And I notice when I'm eating lots of nutrient dense foods, my, my cognitive function is through the roof. So tons of fat soluble vitamins, tons of minerals and electrolytes through red meat, whole eggs, fruit, organ meats and organ supplements when I can get them mineral supplements like Jordan supplement optimized minerals or just straight up salt water and electrolytes. The difference specifically when I supplement the minerals and the electrolytes on my cognition and my energy levels is crazy. And I believe that a lot of the reason my ADHD was so severe and now it's so manageable is because these nutrient deficiencies are corrected. And I'm not saying that that's the case for everybody, but I certainly don't need to be on amphetamines and Adderall anymore because I just don't need it. I feel good every day. I feel locked in. And so the thing that I didn't expect is the the cognitive side. So outside of the diet, there are some, I left my fan on, so my paper wants to blow away. Um, outside of the diet, there's also the, the portion of exercise that has a positive effect on our cognition. Now, there has been research done. Uh, one study, for example, found that when subjects took a cognitive and memory-based test, cognitive memory and reflex-based test, before and after a light bout of zone one to zone two exercise, which was a brisk walk in the study, compared to a control group, they performed better in those tests after the bout of exercise, which I believe was a 20 minute walk, brisk walk. Now that is a lot of things at play. Number one, first and foremost, that's blood flow. You just need blood in the brain. When we sit like I am right now, our legs folded, the blood tends to settle further down in our body and away from our brain. So if you're feeling lethargic throughout the workday, get your ass up and go walk. It's something I did before a big meeting or a big sales call in the corporate world. I'd always take a brisk walk, even if it was just for five minutes. And I know it was responsible for closing more deals and making more money, which I'll get into in a minute, because I was just sharper. You couldn't throw me off as easily when my brain was working right. And yet so many people 
wake up and fucking sit all morning and then have a sugary 300 calorie coffee with a croissant and then go into a meeting at 11 a.m. and wonder why they're foggy. I'll tell you why, idiot. It's because you're not, sorry, that was mean. Sorry. Sorry, hold on. Let me take a deep breath. I'll tell you why, Janet. It's because you're simply not moving and not feeding your brain and body what it needs and your blood sugar's all over the place. I need to educate with love and respect, not, not anger and strife. Also, it's it's the morning time. I'm enjoying a nice cup of coffee out of my Higher Up Wellness coffee mug. I'm thinking about dropping merch. Let me know if you're interested in that. Not a mug, but t-shirts and hoodies. Anyway, so focusing on getting exercise and activity gives my brain blood flow. It also gives me dopamine, epinephrine or norepinephrine or adrenaline and serotonin. All promote positive cognitive function. Dopamine... The reason ADHD exists is it's a dopamine deficiency and Adderall boosts dopamine. So it's why people take it. When you have dopamine flowing in the adequate levels in the brain, you're able to focus on the task at hand because you're gaining dopamine from it. So I take things like 5-HTP with B6 and choline and caffeine and lion's mane and I pair that with physical activity to produce more dopamine in my brain because I have an issue with dopamine production. And it allows me to slip into deep work and focus and listen and talk easier. Right now I feel razor sharp. Recalling my thoughts is easier because I'm taking care of my physical activity. I walked for a half hour briskly this morning. Um, I had my electrolytes. I got morning sunlight and my dopamine is all up because I took my supplements, my pre-podcast stack as I call it, which I'll talk about in another episode. The next thing, number two sort of plays into number one, and that is my anxiety or symptoms of, of depressive feelings. Now, I don't struggle with depression. I know some people do, and I'm not saying this is a cure-all, but the fact of the matter is the way you feel at any given moment is a balance or imbalance of certain neurotransmitters in your brain. When you're depressed, you're probably very low in serotonin and dopamine. When you're very stressed, you're very high in cortisol and epinephrine. And that's why we have SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They allow our body to create and and, or that we thought they did. They just released a study that SSRIs more than 50% of the time just don't work, which means statistically they're ineffective. And of the 50, 49% that were better, they only reported about a 30 to 50% in improvement in their symptoms. So they weren't, they're not cures. SSRIs are bullshit, respectfully, at least for a lot of people. Uh, those aren't my words. Go listen to Tony Robbins talk about it. He talks about it all the time. I think it's very interesting and it's all rooted in scientific data. Now, <clears throat> I'm on one this morning. So we know that exercise can boost those neurotransmitters. So if we need to feel less depressed and less anxious, we need more dopamine. What's a great way to do that? Sweat, run, hit workouts, hard strength training, a cold plunge. Cold plunge has been shown to raise circulating baseline levels of dopamine by 250%. If you ever have gotten ice cold water, I dunked my face in ice water this morning because I don't have a plunge. You know how much better you can feel. So uh, in some countries even, They prescribe rigorous exercise as a level one intervention to anxiety and depression before they're even allowed to prescribe you SSRIs. You have to be on an exercise regimen for, I think, four to six weeks before they'll even consider prescribing you SSRIs. You think we'd ever do that in the U.S.? Fuck no. Not a shot because there's no money in healthy people. All right. Let me me take the tinfoil hat off. Um, But it's simply harder to work me up. When I've exercised after a 10 mile run, you're just not going to make me anxious. You're not going to make me angry. You're not going to say something that's going to piss me off. I'm at peace. I have never met a runner or an ultra runner who's mad about a lot of shit. And I've never met somebody who just trains their body rigorously daily that has a horrible baseline of anxiety. And again, I'm not saying this is everybody's experience. A lot of this is my unique anecdotal experience with a little bit of scientific research in there to back it up. So for me, I simply feel more relaxed and have a better baseline, a lower baseline of anxiety and a higher sense of gratitude for my life when I am training and eating correctly. Shifting into topic number three, my earning capacity, my success in my career. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm self-employed now, but before this, I was in corporate America. So I graduated with a bachelor's degree in professional sales as one of the best students in the country, subtle flex. But in reality, I was, I was like third in the nation of these programs across the country. And uh, I graduated with a great job and I was a guinea pig. I was the first out of college hire they'd ever had, ever. And this was a hard job. It was selling complex information technology services. I had to learn IT, I had to know it sort of as well as 
call it an engineer with six months of experience. Sorry, I'm drinking coffee. Sorry for the pause. And it was hard. Um, now there's research to support that physically fit people earn on average 10% more than people who aren't physically fit. So let me talk about my experience with this and why I think that may have had an impact on me. I believe there's a lot of facets here or a lot of factors and variables. Number one, I went into a job uncertain, but I had a lot of self-confidence. I had confidence in myself that I could figure out this complex task. And I had built that confidence through knowing that I can stick to things for a long time that are difficult, working out, building a body, eating right, learning about fitness. I taught myself like I can do hard things. And that, as I've said many times before, that confidence bleeds into other facets. And I knew when I walked in this job, I was like, this is going to be hard, but that's okay. I can figure this out. And I did. And I ended up making President's Club my first three years in this role and was very successful as a young guy, which they were not expecting and was moving into management as a 25 year old. When I quit, I was on that track and it was unprecedented for the company. I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this. I believe that my foundation of physical health was a catalyst for that. I also believe that being in the job I was in a sales job that can be high stress. You're earning your living situation depends on how hard you work. You have to think on your feet. You never know what kind of personality profile you're going to get on the other end of the phone or what, what surprises are going to be thrown in a meeting. I've seen some, I've had crazy shit happen to me in sales calls, um, cancellations, just stress. And I believe because my brain worked better because I was sharper, because my energy levels were better. I made better decisions. I was able to overcome objections easier. I had more confidence to ask for the sale. Bad sales reps don't ask for the sale, but I had no problem saying, would you like to go ahead? Or why don't we move forward? I had confidence in myself, but I was sharp. And if a prospect hit me with a hard objection, I was prepared to handle that. And I believe it was because I was feeding my brain what it needed. I was getting rigorous exercise. I was sleeping well. I was hydrating. And you put all of my skill sets equal next to a version of me that doesn't exercise. I beat that guy because that guy's just duller. He's just not as sharp as I am. So if you want to perform better in a role that requires a lot of cognitive load or a lot of thinking on your feet, heavy heavy task work that you have to get in deep work for, or think a lot for, I encourage you to make exercise and good diet a big premise or a big foundation of your life. There's an interesting book that I don't agree with everything in it, but it's ahead of its time. It's called The Corporate Athlete. And I'm trying to get the author on my podcast. I can't remember his name right now, but it's from the early 2000s. So there are some dietary things that aren't necessarily accurate anymore or that I don't agree with. But he talks about if you want to be a high performer in the corporate world, you need to treat your body like that of a professional athlete and you will outperform everybody and the highest performing CEOs, VPs, and executives are already doing this. There was a, something I read once where at some of the fortune five companies, if you want to be in the C-suite, you have to do a VO two max test. I mean, you have to get on a treadmill and go until you can't, they need to know that if you're going to make decisions on behalf of a company that big, your brain and your body need to be functioning at top tier. So if those guys are doing it, why aren't you? That's just, that's just my thought. So I believe that I was able to earn the way I was and, and be in the mid six figures as a 24 year old because of my foundation of physical health. And of course, work ethic was a part of it, but you know where I learned that work ethic, training my body, training my mind. I know I'm all bringing it all back to fitness, but that's just what works for me. Number four, this is an interesting one is my dental health. Uh, my dental health has drastically improved since I was a kid. Growing up from the time I started going to the dentist to the time I was probably 16, I had a lot of cavities, probably more than six. And the last time I went to the dentist a couple of years ago, the doctor had told me, he, he was like, I, I don't think I've ever seen stronger enamel. And there's some interesting stuff here to unpack. Number one, my dentist told me when you eat a lot of simple sugars, simple carbohydrates, you have bacteria in your mouth that live by feeding on the sugars that you give it. And if you give it a lot, of, a lot of simple sugars, then it will eat those sugars very fast and those bacteria produced, produced, produce, Jesus, waste. And their waste, their byproduct is acidic on your teeth and breaks down your enamel over time. But if you eat a lot of vegetables and complex carbohydrates, they don't break those down as quickly and as efficiently, making less, less waste. And then you can brush your teeth and brush that sugar and debris away. So... Eating a lot of complex carbohydrates and fibrous vegetables give the teeth a better chance. But also, foods that require a lot of mastication, chewing. No, I said mastication. Get your mind out of the gutter. That means chewing. 
And I eat a lot of steak, requires a lot of chewing. A lot of vegetables require a lot of chewing. And I don't drink sugary beverages ever. So I have very little simple sugar. And if I do, it's honey. That's it. I don't eat anything, any form of sugar that's not bound in fiber, at least not regularly. So there was a doctor, in, or maybe he was a dentist. I know he was an, a, a PhD of some sort, named Weston A. Price. And in the 30s, Weston A. Price went along across the world and lived with these tribes in different parts of the world. This could have been, uh, I believe it was in Africa, India, Canada, Switzerland, all over the world. And he noticed that there was an interesting commonality between these tribes that despite not having any of the formal dental health practices that we have, they all had large round skulls and heads. They had healthy, wide dental arches, which for those of you who don't know what that is, I had a very narrow arch before I got Invisalign and the Invisalign helped to widen my arch. But he noticed that these, these kids, the elders, all of them had all 32 teeth, which if you know anything, if you've gotten your wisdom teeth out, which I guarantee 60% of you watching this have, then you know that we can't fit all 32 teeth in our mouths yet. They can, their teeth came in straight. They were white and you couldn't find cavities anywhere across these straight white teeth across all of these tribes. And the commonality they shared was their diet. They didn't eat white flour. They didn't eat white sugar. They didn't eat seed oils and all this bullshit that we introduced into our diet. No, I'm not a seed oil tinfoil hat wearer. I don't believe they're probably that good for us. But the point is, civilization hadn't gotten to these people. There was a, a divide between them. Some of them in literal mountains and physical structures that kept them from getting like modern day food shipped to them. But they just ate real food and their diet, this is the interesting part, this is what it consisted of. A lot of meat, a lot of red meat, specifically in those Canadian and Swiss tribes, a lot of animal foods, steak and beef that required a lot of chewing, a lot of fibrous vegetables, and the diet was very high in fat, fat-soluble vitamins A, E, D, and K, which Price then went on to theorize that those vitamins have a lot to do with our enamel and how they form. I mean, that makes sense. Our teeth are bones. And our bones are our bones. And we always know like you want calcium, you want vitamin D for strong bones. And they were drinking raw milk and they were drinking or they were eating uh, meats and they were drinking bone broth. So it was almost like an animal-based framework. I'm not here telling you to change your whole life today and change your whole diet, but I know that that's how I eat. And I feel so good. And my blood work is great. My skin has never been better. So he theorized that foods with lots of chewing required even at an early age, these babies were chewing on organs and beef, and it forces the mouth to grow strong enamel, right? Our body responds to the stimulus that we put upon it, just like working out. And he theorized that pacifiers and these soft foods that we were giving our children were telling the body, you don't need to grow strong enamel. You can grow a narrower dental arch. You don't need strong teeth because we're not placing the demand on it. That makes a lot of sense to me. Just like working out, it's just like mouth taping. You tape, don't tape your mouth shut. We have evidence to support that your jawline will recede and you will look less aesthetically pleasing. So once I started eating this way, I mean, I haven't had a cavity in 10 years and I just eat basically a similar way that these guys were eating. So I thought it was very interesting that despite no formal dental practices, Weston A. Price found that these tribes all had beautiful dental health. And the statement he had was to my dismay, he was trying to prove the, I guess, the case for an animal or a plant-based diet. It's like, to my dismay, I cannot find a single tribe that has thriving health off of eating exclusively plant foods, or he said something to that effect. And I thought it was very interesting. I'm not promoting meat propaganda or anything here. I just think that that's an interesting point. I'll let you interpret the information how you want. On to point number five, how others treated me. That is a shame and it's unfair, but it's true. And this is one of those concepts where you can sit on the sidelines and bitch about how the rules of the game are unfair, or you can learn the rules and learn how to win. It's the game of life. And one of the unfortunate dispositions of the human condition is that we make snap judgments. It's in our nature. And whether you want to admit it or not, when you see someone that looks sloppy, that's overweight, that doesn't look put together, you make character judgments. And you could be wrong. And most of the time you probably are. Those are good people. There's, not, there's nothing right about what we do, but we can't help the way we inherently perceive people. So why not? stack the deck in your favor. And when I got fitter, I noticed people treated me differently. And it's, it's a lot of things. One, people were starting to ask me for advice on like, well, man, first off, people would just 
unsolicited bring up, yeah, man, I've been in the gym. I'm just trying to like, I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to get fitter. And I'm like, dude, I did not ask. I did not respectfully. I did not ask. Why are you bringing this up to me? It's almost like a overcompensation. I don't know. It's weird. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. If you work out a lot, people will just bring it up to you against your will. But I also noticed, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be seen as an authority on this, but like people would also just start to come to me for advice. But overall, people view you as an authority on something when you see that that, that they have something or they see that you have something that, that you can't buy that is exemplary of your personality traits. And the fact of the matter is a physique does show your personality traits. It shows that you're able to stick to something long-term. It shows you're able to do hard things and they do perceive you differently. And I believe this also benefited me. People treated me differently in my job because I believe there's a preconceived notion we have. If someone's in shape and they're in a position of power, they're in a position of trying to help that maybe our human nature says that person could take better care of me. That person's going to look out for me because they're very put together. Um, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you guys think I'm a pretentious asshole for saying that. If so, let me know in the comments. That's fine. I'm still going to believe it. <laughs> but the the point is I, we make these snap judgments about people and people started treating me better. Service workers, people in my life, friends, potential partners, dating opportunities like that all got easier when I got fitter. And while it's a shame and it's unfair and I don't necessarily agree with it in principle, it's true. And that's what I find myself was I decided to exploit the rules of the game to the best of my ability and you should do the same thing. And you may find that that pretty privileged thing that people talk about comes into play for you and that even if you don't love the way you look from a face or aesthetic standpoint, get ripped and I promise you'll look better. And I promise you that unfortunately, people will treat you differently despite how unfair that is. The last point, number six, style, dress, clothing, that all got easier. As you can see now, I'm wearing a t-shirt and I wear a t-shirt like this with a pair of like Lulu pants and a nice pair of shoes. Sometimes I wear a decent watch, but that's it. No matter where I go, really, I wear a t-shirt pants, decent white shoes, and I can go anywhere. And it's because your physique is an accessory in and of itself. You look better in plain clothes and you don't have to do that much. Not that I'm saying that caring about style or wanting to dress in trendy eccentric accessories is is unnecessary. I know a lot of fit people who do that too. It's just, I don't care about it and I don't have to care about it because I look good, respectfully, respectfully. God, am I being a cocky asshole on this episode? I'm sorry. I'm just trying to be objective with myself. I look better in plain clothes than I did when I was fat. I don't have to worry about doing the, you fat boys know what I'm about to do. The fat boy pull, you know, this, this whole number right here, if you're watching me, pulling the shirt out to hide the gut, I still do that subconsciously. But I can just wear clothes that accentuate my physique and my physique in and of itself is an accessory. So I don't have to worry that much about it. And I'm glad that I don't, I don't have to worry about how I look in a white shirt versus a black shirt. I don't have to wear, what is that noise? A oh, sprinkler system outside. I don't have to worry about what I'm going to wear that much because I have my accessory. It's my physique. And it encourages me to train harder and train more because I simply look better in plain clothes. And the same would apply to you. So if you hate the way you look or you can never find clothes that fit right, get jacked. It gets way easier. I'm telling you. The, the, I saw an interesting analogy last night when I was thinking about the topic for this episode. And this is, again, unfair and maybe a little harsh, but it's true. Uh, and it was, it was Tristan Tate, actually. I don't even know if it was AI or not, but he was, it was just a short on Instagram. And he said, I saw a fat guy in a really nice designer suit and a fit guy in a cheap suit. And the fact of the matter is the obese guy looked worse in the nice suit than the fit guy did in the cheap suit because your physique accentuates the clothing you wear. Your physique is the style. And it's true. If you put me now and me in 2017, yikes, in the same outfit I'm in right now, that guy ooh, does not look good. Well, the neck beard and the buzz cut doesn't help. Uh, if you follow me on Instagram, you know what that looks like. It was a dark time for me. I don't know who the hell let me go outside like that. Anyway, the point is, um, your physique is your accessory. And if you want to get the most out of basic clothing, get fit. It'll help so much. It'll make your life so much easier. And I never really have to think about what I'm wearing when I go out because I like the way I look. I love my body and I'm not afraid to admit that. I'm confident in myself and I love myself. And you should too. <laughs> so those are the six points, the six things that drastically improved and continue to improve in my life as a result of building a foundation of physical health. And I think that you will find the exact same things to be true if you're on your self-development journey and building your physique. And it may take a while to get where you want to be, but that's okay. Just keep showing up and eventually you have the physique that you always dreamed of. 
You'll have people coming to you and asking you for insight and advice. You'll earn more in your job. You'll think better. You'll think clearer and sharper. You'll make better decisions. Your teeth may improve. Uh, all these things will get better for you. So with that being said, I'm going to close out on a step check. It is 946 Eastern Standard Time, and I am at 4,810 steps. What a strong start to the day. I love waking up earlier. Thank God. Uh, I am heading out to Houston, Texas today for the Echo Vision Meetup. I'll be in Houston from the 12th to the 15th. So if you're there, come say hello. We're training at Alpha Land. And drop your step check in the comments and let me know what you thought about this episode. If you haven't subscribed yet, if you're on YouTube, please do. It means the world. If you haven't rated the episode on Spotify, please do. It means the world. It actually does help me out a lot. I appreciate you guys. I'm humbled to have, to have the opportunity to do this every single week. And I hope you have a great weekend, everybody. Take care.